Welcome along, Strange Historians. This is the Strange History Podcast. Before I begin, please like and share this episode and subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Oh, and do me a favor and check out the links below to learn how to support my channel. So now, sit back. And pour yourself a cup of coffee, or a tankard of tea, or a mug of mead, or a chalice of cider, or a flagon, filled with any beverage of your choice, and join your fellow strange historians around the campfire. In the late 1700s, Boston was the capital of the province of Massachusetts Bay and an important shipping town. There was a lot of wealth in Boston, but there was also a lot of resistance against the presence of the British soldiers who were stationed there. Since September of 1768, there had been two regiments of foot soldiers of the British Army quartered in Boston. These were hardened soldiers in the 18th century and they wore a distinct red uniform and were referred to as the Redcoats. They were there because of protests against the Townsend Act in 1768, which led Sir Francis Bernard, he was the governor of Massachusetts Bay, to call upon them to restore order and respect for British law. But then he was recalled after the publication of letters in which he was critical of the colony. Governor Bernard departed the province on June 3rd of 1760, leaving Thomas Hutchinson as acting governor. But the red coats remained, and many residents resented their presence in their city, and the resentment continued to grow. The Townsend Acts, or Townsend Duties, really had Bostonians in an uproar. They were a series of British Acts of Parliament passed during 1767 and 1768 that introduced a series of taxes and regulations to fund administration of the British colonies in America. Colonists objected that the Acts were a violation of the natural, charter, and constitutional rights of British subjects in the colonies. On June 10th, 1768, Customs officials seized Liberty, a sloop owned by leading Boston merchant John Hancock, on allegations that the ship had been involved in smuggling. During the summer of 1769, Boston importers refused to pay custom duties that were imposed upon them by the British. At the time, Boston was filled with many loyalists who employed British soldiers who worked part-time for them when off-duty. A large number of Bostonians disliked the soldiers because they were competing with them for jobs, and the soldiers could work for lower wages. Among the Bostonians who disliked them were seamen because of impressment laws, which, at the time, was the taking of men into the British military or naval force by compulsion with or without notice. It was used by the Royal Navy in wartime beginning in 1664 as a means of crewing warships. During the summer of 1769, Boston importers refused to pay custom duties that were imposed upon them by the British. So these factors and many others led to clashes between soldiers and civilians. As so, the winter of 1770 was a time of great tension in Boston. On February 22, 1770, an 11-year-old boy named Christopher Cedar was shot. He was killed by Loyalist Ebenezer Richardson. He was a custom service employee who had tried to disperse a protest in front of the shop of another Loyalist in the north end of Boston. The crowd threw rocks at him and his home. One broke Richardson's windows and struck his wife. Enraged, Richardson fired a gun into the crowd. He wasn't aiming at anyone in particular, but he wounded Christopher in the arm and the chest, and the kid died that evening. 
Samuel Adams, one of the founding fathers of the United States, called Christopher, and this is a quote, the first martyr of American liberty, end quote. Cedar's funeral was attended by more than 2,000 Bostonians, and his death fueled public outrage. On March 2nd of 1770, a fist fight broke out between soldiers and employees of John Gray's Rope Walk after one of the employees insulted a soldier, and the soldier returned later with about a dozen redcoats, and the fight ensued. A few days later, during the cold, snowy evening, of March 5, 1770, around 8pm, Captain Lieutenant John Goldfinch was walking down King Street, today known as State Street. A wig maker's apprentice, who had been drinking quite heavily, named Edward Garrick, began harassing him, screaming out that he had not paid his master's bill. Garrick was around 13 years old and was employed by John Piedmont a wig maker and later tavern keeper. Garrick's job was to tend to the wigs of British soldiers. Garrick was joined by his fellow wig maker's apprentice, Bartholomew Broders. Other local youths joined in, forming a crowd, and they began taunting him and throwing snowballs and oyster shells at him. For the record, it was later learned that the bill had indeed been paid. As Captain John Goldfinch, and the angry crowd of youths neared the Boston Custom House, a British private named Hugh White approached to aid Captain Goldfinch. Hugh White told Edward Garrick that if the bill had not been paid, that it would be paid, and that he should show more respect to Captain Goldfinch. In response, the drunk apprentice, Edward Garrick, insulted and assaulted Hugh White, who, in his defense, struck Garrick in the head with his musket, causing him to fall and cry out. Upon this, more and more civilians approached and joined the angry crowd. Garrick then left the scene and began to spread the word about how he was attacked by a redcoat, which drew more people into the crowd. It was estimated that there are around 50 Bostonians at this point. And many in the crowd were screaming out, Bloody lobster man! Lousy red school! Lobster son of a bitch! Some of the young men threw pieces of ice and rocks and oyster shells at White. In fear for his safety, White retreated to the custom house steps. He loaded his gun and began to wave it about. The crowd grew more and more hostile towards him. Hugh White then knocked on the door and banged the butt of his gun against the steps, and he yelled out, Turn out, main guard! Turn out, main guard, is what he yelled. Meanwhile, a few blocks north, another confrontation between civilians and redcoats broke out. Under a barrage of snowballs, a group of soldiers was hustled into its barracks. There was also a third mob, this one about 200 strong and carrying clubs. They were all riled up nearby and they began streaming down an alley toward King Street. It was at this time, nearly 9 p.m. at night, that someone pulled the first bell rope at the brick meeting house. Thinking there was a fire, dozens of residents ran out into the streets. Meanwhile, a British officer named Thomas Preston who was a captain of the 29th Regiment of Foot, part of the British garrison in Boston, showed up to the scene. He wondered what he should do. Clearly, he and his soldiers were outnumbered. He knew well that province law forbid the military from firing on civilians without the order of a magistrate. On the other hand, if he did nothing, then Hugh White could be killed by the mob. Preston and seven other men lined up in columns of twos. They quickly marched across King Street. They had fixed bayonets. The guns were not loaded at the time. According to Captain Preston's later testimony, he said, and this is a quote, In my way there, I saw the people in great commotion and heard them use the most cruel and horrid threats against the troops. In a few minutes after I reached the guard, about 100 people passed it, 
and went towards the custom house where the king's money is lodged. They immediately surrounded the sentry posted there and, with clubs and other weapons, threatened to execute their vengeance on him. I was soon informed by a townsman their intention was to carry off the soldier from his post and probably murder him. After pushing their way through the crowd, they finally reached Private Hugh White in front of the custom house. Captain Preston ordered the sentry to fall in. According to Captain Preston, this is a quote, The mob still increased and were more outrageous, striking their clubs or bludgeons one against another and calling out, Come on, you rascals, you bloody backs, you lobster scoundrels, fire if you dare, god damn you, fire and be damned, we know you dare not. And much more language was used. End quote. The street was noisy from the crowd, and there were the sounds of church bells being run, which usually signified a fire. Captain Preston made efforts to march the men back to the main guard, but the crowd surrounded them. The soldiers were hemmed in. And so the soldiers lined up in a semicircle about a body length apart. They were then facing the crowd that had grown, by many estimated, to nearly 100 angry Bostonians, many of whom were throwing rocks, coal, sticks, oyster shells, and snowballs at the soldiers. Captain Preston ordered his men to load, which they did. People in the crowd began to torment the soldiers, repeatedly asking them, Why don't you fire? And saying, Go ahead and fire! Fire! And, Damn you! Fire! Standing in front of his soldiers, Captain Preston then shouted for the crowd to disperse. At this point, a large 47-year-old man named Crispus Attucks an American whaler, sailor, and dock worker of African and Native American descent, moved forward. Grabbed soldier Hugh Montgomery and, while wielding a club, knocked the soldier to the ground. During all this, more and more Bostonians were coming out of buildings and screaming, Where is there a fire? Where is there a fire? And, Is there a fire? And because many thought there was a fire because of the ringing of the bell, and people themselves were screaming, fire! 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 Shaken, scared, and angry, Hugh Montgomery rose and unloaded his musket in the direction of the crowd. Captain Preston demanded to know why the soldier fired, at which point Montgomery replied that he was struck on his arm with a club so hard that had he been hit on his head, it would have killed him. At that point, a number of heavy clubs and snowballs were being thrown at the soldiers, and they realized how much danger they were now in. At that point, someone behind the soldiers called out, Damn you bloods, why don't you fire? And upon that, three or four of the soldiers fired, one right after the other. A blast from the gun of Matthew Kilroy killed the rope maker Samuel Gray as he stood with his hands in his pockets. It's been said that the shot blew a hole in his head as big as a hand. The second victim was a 17-year-old ship's mate named James Caldwell. He was killed after Samuel Gray by the subsequent gunfire shot with the two balls entering his back. From another soldier's gun, two balls hit Crispus Attucks in the chest. Samuel Maverick was running when he was hit by a ricocheting bullet. Maverick died within hours of the shooting. Patrick Carr was the fifth victim of the Boston Massacre. He came outside after hearing the sound of the bell on the street, but he did not believe there was a fire and he was used to the clashes between mobs and soldiers, and so he just went outside to see what was going on. It was while he was crossing the street with his neighbor when he was mortally wounded by a soldier's bullet through his abdomen. The 30-year-old man who worked in the leather business died nine days later on March 14th. 
In addition to those who died, six Bostonians were also wounded. Edward Payne was a businessman who worked in the old state house. He watched the events out of the door of his home on King Street and he got struck. Mr. Robert Patterson was wounded when he heard the crowd was screaming, Let's go in upon them and prevent their firing again! Upon which he later claimed he raised his hand to put it on his hat while advancing toward the soldiers. And he felt the balls of the gun going through his lower right arm. He said his arm immediately fell and finding himself wounded, turned and made his way home with some help. According to the Boston Gazette, on March 12th of 1770, there's a quote, a lad named Christopher Monk, about 17 years of age, an apprentice, was wounded. A ball entered his back about four inches above the left kidney near the spine and was cut out of the breast on the same side. End quote. He was crippled and died in 1780, purportedly due to the injuries that he had sustained in the attack a decade earlier. A lad named John Clark, about 17 years of age, he was an apprentice of Captain Samuel Howard, was wounded. A ball entered just above his groin and came out at his hip on the opposite side. A man named David Parker was also shot, as was a gentleman named John Green. The soldiers quickly loaded again, and that was when Captain Preston yelled, Stop firing! Do not fire! Captain Preston asked the soldiers why they fired without his orders. They replied that they heard the word fire and supposed it came from him. He assured them that he gave no such order and that his words were, Don't fire! According to Captain Preston's testimony, on the people's assembling again to take away the dead bodies, the soldiers supposing them coming to attack them were making ready to fire again which Captain Preston prevented by striking up their firelocks with his hand. Immediately after, a townsman came and told him that 4,000 or 5,000 people were assembling in the next street, and they had sworn to take Captain Preston's life and every man with him. He said, as a quote, on which I judged it unsafe to remain there any longer, and therefore sent the party and sentry to the main guard. End quote. According to his testimony, Captain Preston was expecting the mob to pursue and attack them. They were soon joined by the different companies of the 29th Regiment. He formed them as the guard into street firings. He claimed he immediately sent a sergeant with a party to the commanding officer. Several officers going to join their regiment were knocked down by the mob. One was very much wounded and his sword was taken from him. Word of the shootings reached acting Governor Thomas Hutchinson, who rushed to King Street where he saw the angry crowd. Hutchinson confronted Preston and said, and this is a quote, do you know, sir, you have no power to fire on anybody of the public collected together except you have a civil magistrate with you give orders? End quote. Hutchinson then proceeded upstairs in the townhouse where several members of the council had already gathered. He briefly spoke to council members and then he stepped out onto a balcony and asked the crowd for calm and to disperse. He promised them an inquiry and said, and so quote, Let the law have its course. I will live and die by the law. End quote. And with that, the Boston Massacre was over. After midnight, on March 6, 1770, Justices Richard Dania and John Tudor gave the sheriff a warrant for the arrest of Captain Preston. Preston was arrested and brought to the townhouse, where he was interrogated for an hour by the two justices about the shooting. At three o'clock in the morning, the justices concluded that they had, and this is a quote, evidence sufficient to commit him, end quote. 
they sent Preston to the jail where he would remain for the next seven months. Later that morning, John Adams, who was 34 years old at the time, was visited in his office by a Boston merchant named James Forrest. He asked Adams to defend the soldiers and their captain, Thomas Preston. John Adams and Josiah Quincy agreed to defend Preston and the soldiers. Some say he received no payment. Some say he received the modest sum of 18 guineas. So for those who don't know, John Adams was an attorney, a diplomat, a writer, a member of the Continental Congress. He was vice president under George Washington, and he was the second president of the United States. He was, of course, a founding father of the United States of America. Now, as far as Josiah Quincy II, he was an American lawyer and a patriot. He was a principal spokesman for the Sons of Liberty in Boston prior to the Revolution. Both Adams and Quincy understood that taking this case would subject them both to strong public criticism, a heck of a lot of anxiety, and harm to their law practices. But they both believed that every person deserved a defense. In fact, when Adams agreed to take the case, he reportedly justified it by saying that, and this is a quote, counsel ought to be the very last thing that an accused person should want in a free country. End quote. Another counselor, Robert Alkmudi, a loyalist, carried out parts of the summation for the jury. John Adams later recalled that his two co-counsels refused to take the case unless Adams agreed to join the team. Josiah Quincy Jr. was concerned that he would be shunned from Sons of Liberty meetings for fulfilling his ethical obligations as a lawyer. Prosecuting the case were Robert Treat Payne and Josiah's older brother, Samuel Quincy, who shortly after was named Solicitor General. So a little bit about them, Robert Treat Payne was an American lawyer, politician, and founding father of the United States who signed the Continental Association and the Declaration of Independence as a representative of Massachusetts. He served as the state's first attorney general and as an associate justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the state's highest court. Samuel Quincy was an attorney and barrister, solicitor general, and he was a loyalist and the Solicitor General for the colony, counsel for the prosecution, and he was appointed as special prosecutor for the Boston Massacre Trials. On March 8th of 1770, the first four victims of the massacre, Samuel Gray, Samuel Maverick, James Caldwell, and Crispus Attucks were buried in the Granary Burying Ground. All the shops in the area were closed, and church bells rung throughout the city of Boston. On March 12th of 1770, Captain Preston offered his views of the event of March 5th in a deposition. On March 13th of 1770, a grand jury indicted Captain Preston and eight soldiers were indicted for murder in connection with the massacre. A few days later, on March 16, 1770, a frigate carrying reports and letters of Hutchinson relating the events of March 5th left Boston bound for England. And on March 17th of 1770, Patrick Carr was buried at the Boston Granary Burial Ground together with the other victims. Some historic sources speculate that he was buried on a different day because of being the only Catholic among the victims. This speculation is likely unsubstantiated and the different burial date probably had something to do with Carr passing several days after the other victims. Also buried there were the remains of Christopher Cedar. The trial began on November 27th of 1770. The prosecution's most damning evidence came from Samuel Hemingway, who swore that Private Matthew Kilroy, identified by another prosecution witness as the man who shot citizen John Gray, would never miss an opportunity, when he had one, to fire on the inhabitants, and that he had wanted to have an opportunity ever since he landed. 
The defense presented testimony to support its theory that the soldiers fired in self-defense. Adams asked the jury to consider whether it had ever been a prudent resolution in them or in anybody in their situation to have stood still to see if the mob would knock their brains out or not. Adams asked the soldier to consider whether, and this is a quote from him, it had ever been a prudent resolution in them or in anybody in their situation to have stood still to see if the mob would knock their brains out or not. After presenting over 40 witnesses, John Adams summed up the defense. He told the jury, and this is a quote, Soldiers quartered in a populous town will always occasion two mobs where they prevent one. He argued that the soldiers who fired first acted only as one might expect anyone to act in such confused and potentially life-threatening conditions. Do you expect that he should act like a stoic philosopher lost in apathy? Adams asked the jury. Facts are stubborn things, he concluded. And whatever may be our inclinations or the dictums of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. He finished by telling the jury that this was a case of self-defense. He said, I will enlarge no more on the evidence but submit it to you. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Nor is the law less stable than the fact. If an assault was made to endanger their lives, the law is clear. They had a right to kill in their own self-defense. If it was not so severe, as to endanger their lives, yet if they were assaulted at all, struck and abused by blows of any sort, by snowballs, oyster shells, cinders, clubs, or sticks of any kind, this was a provocation for which the law reduces the offense of killing down to manslaughter in consideration of those passions in our nature, which cannot be eradicated. To your candor and justice, I submit the prisoners and their cause. Justices Trowbridge and Oliver instructed the jury. Justice Trowbridge told the 12 men of Boston that, and this is a quote, malice is the grand criterion that distinguishes murder from all other homicides. On December 5th, 1770, after less than three hours of deliberation, the jury acquitted six of the soldiers on all charges. Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy, the only two soldiers clearly proven to have fired, were found guilty of manslaughter. On December 14th, Montgomery and Kilroy came into court, asked if there was any reason why the sentence of death should not be passed. The two men invoked the benefit of clergy, a plea that shifted their punishment from imprisonment to the branding of their thumbs. In late December of 1770, Preston retired from the army. He reportedly settled in Ireland and received 200 pounds in compensation for his troubles relating to the Boston Massacre. Adams later recalled seeing him in London in the 1780s when Adams was serving there as U.S. Minister to Britain. Initial reaction to Adams' role in the case was hostile. His law practice dropped by over half. In the long run, however, the courageous actions of Adams only enhanced his growing reputation. Under the balcony, at the east end of the old state house, a circle of stones sits in the sidewalk, surrounded by a bronze ring proclaiming this as the site of the Boston Massacre. But that's not where it took place. When it was first installed in 1887, the memorial stones were embedded in the middle of the intersection near the site where Crispus Attucks actually fell. Since then, the circular marker has been moved at least three times, once in 1904 for Blue Line subway construction, and again in the 1960s for Government Center Urban Renewal, and most recently in 2011 to build the plaza that's there today. Its current location was chosen merely for safety so that people could stand around the stones without being hit by traffic. And so, this concludes this episode of the Strange History Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, kindly like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell.
If you want to support my research and hear more shows like this, please click on the link below so you can see how you can make a donation directly to me and also join me on other platforms where I post exclusive content. And of course I will appreciate it if you could leave a super thanks below. Kindly be kind to all non-human animals and please don't eat them. They don't like it. Take my word for it. And please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter and adopt a cat or a dog. You and they will be very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels and all your journeys. <laughs>